the portion of scripture that I'd like to draw your attention is actually found in the book of Galatians in chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. I want to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. Here the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this to many of the churches that were throughout this region of Galatia. And he says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And now let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So let it be. In this portion of scripture, when you consider it on uh, this, what I would consider as a sacred day on the Christian calendar, when we reflect on what Jesus did at Calvary, when we think of how the Apostle Paul said, I'm not going to boast in anything but in Jesus Christ and his cross. That tells me, tells you, that uh, the most important reality that we can wrap ourselves around is the cross of Jesus Christ and what that communicates, what that conveys, the message it sends to us, to our family, to the world, that Christianity does involve self-denial and sacrifice and suffering it involves things that are really not in vogue, not only in our culture and society, but even within Christendom. Many times, the gospel's packaged as a feel-good religion. And I'm not opposed to feeling good and being happy and rejoicing and being joyful. But I am opposed to the idea that we would dilute down the gospel message to simply getting happy, feeling good, elevating our self-concept or our self-esteem. That does a great disservice to what the Apostle Paul is declaring here when he says, I'll boast in the cross of Jesus Christ because contained in this reality of the cross is all that Jesus bore, that he suffered. It also communicates the very, the very heartbeat of the gospel message that all have sinned, fall short of God's standard and of his glory. And we are in desperate need of a savior. Again, that is not in vogue. That's not palatable in our society or culture. They don't like to talk about sin. And they don't like to talk about Jesus as being savior. Oh, a fine, marvelous, profound philosopher or teacher, or even potentially a prophet. But to call him savior infers the Reality that we have to be saved from something, and what is that? A low self-esteem? No. The reality of the transgressions and the iniquity and the sins that all of us have participated in, in thought, attitude, action, deed, conduct, behavior. And so the Apostle Paul centers that reality in our hearts, and then he just continues to drive that in. And then he makes a statement that I have here before you in Galatians 6 and verse 17. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. If any of you were reared in Catholicism, you know this is re referenced to as the stigmata because it's actually coming from that particular Greek word. Stigmata. A mark. A print. I know that when you peer back in history, there's different individuals that this is associated with. Some we're very familiar with, like St. Francis of Assisi or Padre Pio. And it's not for me this afternoon to try to make this an issue of debate or endorsement or approval or to 
come against and attack that. That's, that's not where I'm going. The focus of this moment as we ponder on this scripture is not to think of literal, physical marks that would appear on our hands or feet or side, those wounds, but the reality that I am marked as his. The book of Revelation, we know in the end days that there's going to be a time when there will be individuals that will take on the mark of the beast. Saying, I identify, I am associated with, I am submitted to, I'm connected to, in communion with, I pay my allegiance to the beast, the Antichrist. But here the Apostle Paul, and I believe it's a challenge for us as we reflect on Calvary and, and the marks that Jesus literally bore upon his hands and feet, side and upon his head. Jesus, those marks, what do they communicate about us being marked for the Lord? I want to be able to say just as authentically as the Apostle Paul said, I bear the marks of Jesus Christ in my life. His print is indelibly inscribed upon my life. Maybe not physically my body, but upon my heart and my soul and my mind. That when you look at my life, you will know I am his. When Paul writes this, obviously he's probably reflecting on his own experience with physical persecution. Something that maybe some of us will experience. I know that all of us here, if you really have communicated the gospel to others, you are going to experience, again, reflecting on Calvary, the rejection and the ridicule and the mockery that comes in association with it. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, that the cross to the world is foolishness. He goes on to say, and it is a stumbling block to the Jews. Foolishness to the Greeks and Gentiles. It's absor absurd, it's, it's ludicrous, it's ridiculous. Why does, why does your message have to get so, so bloody and painful? The world is infested with so much suffering. Can't you elevate us with some religious thoughts that don't center in on this painful suffering, rejection? Described in Isaiah 53 that he was despised, he was rejected, he was bruised for our iniquity, chastised, ridiculed, suffered and died. Here, the gospel, when it's proclaimed, when we associate truly, authentically with the cross, there will be a level of mockery from the world, considering us not to be all that sharp, maybe, intellectually, or stable emotionally, or we don't see the broad picture from an eclectic mindset that would be open-minded to, to see the, the vast array of all different belief systems that could lead to God. Your cross is interpreted as foolishness. Maybe for us right now, we feel the impact of that verbal persecution. Paul identified with the physical persecution recorded in 2 Corinthians 11, in prison, flogged severely, five times 40 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once pelted with stones. I must say honestly and candidly, the most I've experienced when I've shared the gospel with others, maybe someone's pushed me, Oh, they've mocked me or belittled me or were condescending in their, in their reaction or their response and maybe said some nasty things and you could feel the, the Niagara of their, of their rejection and their ridicule, but physically being hurt or injured, the, the worst I had is when I knocked on a door and we were doing door-to-door -door evangelism and when I opened the door and began to share the good news, the guy spit on my face and that was the worst of it. For me. I remember when I was in India, Itarsi, Central India, had the honor and the privilege of speaking to about 600 Indian pastors at a conference. After it was over, I was going out and I was shaking hands with different individuals and there was this one young, young pastor. He looked like he was in his mid-twenties. He came up and I went to shake his hand and I noticed he couldn't extend his hand to me because his limb was, 
was gone half of it. I never inquired. I just embraced him quickly. And, and uh, then the interpreter allowed us to dialogue with one another. And he was about to venture out again into another village. Afterwards, I went to the missionary that I was being hosted by. And I, I said, uh, Pastor Thomas, that, that, uh, that young man, uh, what, what was that about his, his limb? It looked recent. He said, oh, it was. He said within the last six months, he had gone into a particular village in northern India where it's very challenging. There you confront not only radical Islam, but you confront radical Hinduism. But among some radical Hindus in this particular village, because he was handing out the Bible with his right arm, they cut it off. But his response, he said, I got my left arm in hand, and so I'm going to continue to go to villages and pass the Bible out with that hand. Oh, I, was ch I was challenged, convicted, moved to tears at that moment because I thought of someone who was marked. See, his life was literally, physically, tangibly marked by being associated with Jesus Christ. But there's also the realm of us having the mark of ownership. See, when Paul develops this not theology, but truth for us. He does it within the milieu or the context of the first century culture where among the slaves they would be branded. And in that branding, they, others would come and know who their owner was. And it's the same word that's used here when he says, I, I bear the marks. You can almost translate that as, I bear the branding of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it communicates to us, I want to leave this service maybe with a deeper commitment. Maybe my, my action point to this, my takeaway from this Good Friday service is to say, I want all the more, Lord, to bear the marks that in my lifestyle, my conduct, my behavior reflects the fact that I am owned by you. I belong to you. You are my master. So that when someone looks on, when I look at my own life, or when others look on, they'll form the conclusion that person doesn't own their life. They are a, a slave. They are a prisoner in the most positive sense of the Lord. Not held by a chain, but by commitment. The commitment, though, is so strong, so deep, and so tight, it might, be, it might appear to others as a chain. Maybe that's why Paul says, I'm a doulos, I'm a slave of Christ. That, he, that when, when, I, when I show you my calendar, you can say, wow, you don't own your life. When I show you my checkbook, you say, oh, he doesn't own his life. When you look at other areas, that, that there's a mark, there's a branding that declares very clearly, this is not my life. He owns my life. But it's not tyranny, it's paradoxically liberty. I blossom and bloom and fulfill the destiny that is on my life. But he owns my life. Maybe visit that for a moment and say, yeah, I want, I want to say I bear the marks of Christ. Maybe not with physical persecution, but in the area of ownership. Owns my life. I, the property of my master. And it also marks our devotion. It's a mark of our passion and devotion to him that when I look at your life I would know you are marked for Christ because he is the highest priority of your life your passion your focus your desires are toward him I know all the other stuff we have to be involved in I'm not dismissing that and we have excitement with a variety of different things that we go about doing throughout the day but there would be a pulsating reality that would just come forth from your life, that would say, you bear the marks of Jesus. The stigmata is on you. When I look at your life, 
how you process through choices and decisions, your lifestyle, how you handle your time, manage your finances, engage in relationships. You're marked. I can tell you're owned by him and you are devoted to him. He's number one, not two or three. He's number one in your life. May that be our quest. May that be our, our full desire. Authentic faithfulness, devotion to him, even when it involves some suffering. Well, you have to, I'm not endorsing being masochistic or ascetic, but there is an aspect that a discipline of pursuing him and seeking him and making him first, there will be a militant, violent aspect to that because everything in hell and everything in our society will try to wedge itself in there to get first place. But I want to have the mark I want the mark, I want the stigmata on my life. That when you look at me or when I look at you, I can say, wow, I know. You got the marks of ownership, you've got the marks of devotion. And the last, you have the marks of being like Jesus. That when I look at your life, you're, you reflect his character. You, you resemble his heart and, and you reveal his his very will to this world. And I think of the passage in the Gospel of John. I'm asked those now if you would prepare yourself to serve communion. I think of the passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I'd like you to associate it with this mark of being like Christ. Remember when Thomas comes, he says, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my hand in the mark or the print, it's the same uh, concept, same word that's being used there as Paul does in Galatians. In the print, the mark of Jesus in his hands and in his side. And then when he experiences that, eight days later it says in the Gospel of John 20, He'll come and he will have that opportunity to touch the marks and it becomes a convincing reality to him. And I know we belittle Thomas and say he needed that. Think of the amount of people that need to see the mark on you but also need to touch it. That you... Yes, you and I as believers, you know Paul wasn't writing this as just identifying, look, I bear the marks of Jesus, I'm isolated, none of you will uh, attain to that. Or like I said, out of church history, this idea that the stigmata is only for this elite few that have this incredible level of piety, that they have the blood dripping from their hands and their side. I know that that's not the point of that scripture. The point of that scripture is to say to you and to me, you have the opportunity by the power of the Holy Spirit to bear the marks of Jesus Christ, to have the stigmata upon your life with how you handle things, what you do with your mind and your thinking, what you express from your side, your heart, where you place your feet. It will reveal You've been marked. You have the marks of Christ with your devotion to him, with you being like him, and that you're owned by him. Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd help all of us to really hear what I believe your spirit is speaking to me, to all of us. Not to open the door of any guilt or condemnation, but an invitation to go deeper in our relationship with you. I pray as we focus now on communion. When you were raised from the dead, you still had the marks on your body. I pray that, Lord, we would stop and say, Lord, I want to recommit, rededicate my life so strongly to you that as I partake of these elements of the bread and the juice, 
It's me saying to you, I want to say I bear the marks of Jesus in my body, soul, and spirit. I'm going to ask you just to take the bread and just lift it a little higher as I read the scripture. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together of the bread that sacredly symbolizes his broken body. Mark our life, Lord. May our lives, may my life be marked by you, Jesus. Branded as being owned by you. Devoted to you. Reflecting you to my world. That we bear in our body, in our life, the marks of Jesus. Would you lift the cup that holds the juice as it symbolizes his shed blood? The scripture says in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together of the juice that symbolizes in a sacred way his shed blood. We thank you, Lord. We're blood washed. We're cleansed, we're redeemed. One day when we face you, we'll not face you as a judge, but our blessed heavenly Father. To you be the honor and the glory and the praise. Let's stand together and call Eucharistia the giving of thanks. Would you just personally say, Lord, thank you for the honor that I can be associated with you. Mark my hands, mark my feet. Mark my side, my heart, mark my mind with the crown of thorn. Mark me that when anyone sees me, they'll say, you're owned by Jesus. You're devoted to Jesus. You reflect Jesus. Lord, mark our lives. Mark our lives deeply in the name that is above every name, the name of the Lord. Now may the blessing of the Lord descend over your life. By the grace of God and by the work of the Holy Spirit, may you in a fresh new way bear the very marks of Jesus. With every choice and decision, with every attitude and action, with your beliefs and your behavior, with the totality of your whole being, your mind enveloped, your heart pierced through God's will. Your hands and your feet where you go and what you touch. And may your life be so marked that when others look and listen, see and touch like Thomas with Jesus, they'll come to believe because you are a genuine and authentic witness unto Christ. So let this be upon you now in Him owning you and you devoted 
and reflecting him. In Jesus' name, I pray this blessing by the providence and sovereignty of the Spirit of God as this was his message, knowing those who'd be here. Let it be your reality now deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you say, I receive that, Lord. I so receive that.